A couple weeks ago, Dan Olson, the guy behind Folding Ideas, put up a video about our current situation, specifically how he's Schrodinger's coping with it. He said he's been watching 2011's Contagion, as are a lot of people through Netflix, and parts of Dan's shared experience resonated with me. And I am in an absolute haze. My daily life has not much been impacted overtly. I'm already an agoraphobic shut-in who works online and has a bad sleep schedule, but it's too much. I'm tired all the time, I can't pay attention to the news, and I can't not pay attention to the news. Working is difficult. I'm also living the YouTuber lifestyle and rarely leave my apartment, so the shelter in place hasn't made a huge change in my day-to-day -day life. And if I don't look into things too closely, I'm fine. I'm handling things totally fine. Except for the part where I'm not. I'll expand on that in a sec. I've had a handful of requests to make a video about our current situation, and I can't bring myself to do it. One type of request is to talk about the misinformation going around and why people seem so eager to fall for it. And another type of request is for healthy coping strategies. The problem is I feel like part of my coping approach is basically denial. To talk about the misinformation going around, I would have to wade into everything that's being said right now, and I can't. I've practically been spammed about healthy strategies to get through the self cue and social distancing from anybody I'm on a mailing list for. Health insurance, pet food, grocery stores, beauty stores, like everybody is trying to be helpful in this. And other than sticking to a rough approximation of the schedule that I've always had, I can't really do much more than that. Behaviorally, I'm having the sorts of things that go along with the start of a depressive episode. I'm struggling to concentrate, although I think this fog is something that's affecting a lot of people right now. The indecision in what to do or how to fill my time that ends up with me sitting on the couch, flipping between streaming apps and games, starting five or six different things before losing interest, ending up back on YouTube, and watching fail compilations or cat videos until I'm tired enough to go to sleep. In the back of my mind, I kept thinking about Dan's method of coping by watching something that handled the current situation, and I finally found the drive to do something. And that something is the topic of today's video, the relatively indie game from 2018, Vampire. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, and patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel! Let's get right into it. So we'll start by talking about the game's plot, spoiler free, and mechanics with some critique mixed in there before getting to the relevance I find in this game for our current situation. Vampire, or based on how it's spelled, Vampir was developed by Don't Nod Entertainment, who is a studio most known for the Life is Strange video games. This game follows Jonathan Reed, a British doctor who is just returning to London after fighting in World War I. In the opening cinematic, Reed is attacked by a mysterious force and, spoilers, wakes up a vampire. The main plot of the game is Reed trying to find out who made him a vampire and also to find a cure. Along the way, Reed makes some friends, enemies, and corpses, partially based on your choices. This would be a good time to mention that a repeated selling point in the Don't Nod games is an emphasis on player choice having a consequence on the way the story develops, and this doesn't always feel fully implemented. A criticism I've seen from people who talk games for a living is that sometimes the choices you make do have an impact, and other times they don't. This becomes a nuisance when you can't tell what sort of choice you're making. I'm not necessarily saying that the impactful choices have to be explicitly indicated with big neon lights indicating that this choice will have consequences. But when the little Y graphic appears in the dialogue wheel, that's supposed to represent a player choice that may have consequences, intended or not. And in fairness, sometimes it does. However, sometimes very different dialogue options end up at the same place narrative-wise. Example. At one point, a friendly character is being blackmailed and needs your help in making it stop. And there are several options in how to deal with the blackmailer that have huge consequences in the story. 
But when you report back to the friendly character, they are incredibly unhappy with you if you didn't take the permanent solution. Briefly. One line, it's, I'm so disappointed in you, how could you do this? To normal conversation, everything's fine. The contrast between the two is jarring. And you would think, given how unhappy that character was with you for that brief second, that it would have some sort of lasting impact on your future relationship with them, or at least some sort of speed bump, but nope. Story's got a story. That being said, I don't want to give the wrong impression here. The consequences can be huge and impactful for seemingly small choices, and the way it plays out is interesting and actually caught me off guard a couple times. In one instance, something I thought was a straightforward good choice ended up getting a bunch of characters killed. Whoops. And subverting my expectations about good choice leading to a good outcome made the game that much more interesting and engaging moving forward. But it's a double-edged sword. The game does not let you save. The game does not give you direct access to the save files. This means that choices you've made are permanent. You can't go back and change it once you've done something. I'm sure for some people this enhances the experience, but as someone who likes to save before a conversation, see how it goes, then possibly reload if I didn't like the outcome, being locked into a path can be uncomfortable. Although, two years post-launch, there's enough fan guides out there that I can just look up the consequences because I can't just roll with it. In that blackmail example I talked about, I ended up having to start over with a new game because I was trying to feel my way through a no-kill playthrough, and that got thrown out the window because of that one choice. But enough about my safe scumming ways. Let me expand on the no-kill playthrough a little. There's basically tiers of NPCs in this game. At the top are the characters who won't really be impacted by your choices, at least until it's important for the story. Basically, they've got plot armor. They need to make it to certain points in the story to act in certain ways, so your choices won't do much more than change dialogue here or there. Although, once you get to that character's narrative turning point, the plot armor falls off and potentially bad things could happen to them. This includes Reed's love interest, as well as the pillars of the community. In the tier below that are the citizens living in the different districts. These are the characters living in combat-free zones who you can talk to, help out, medicate, or make a snack out of. But if you help them out first, learn more about them, they'll give you more XP when you turn them into a snack. In the lowest tier are the unnamed baddies that have no interaction possible other than Smash Face. There is no talking with these characters, and there are no ramifications for killing them. If anything, you need to kill them because they're more than happy to kill you. Fortunately, these mobs don't count toward the good doctor's morality, which is an unfortunate break between the narrative and gameplay. So the no-kill playthrough, which gets you a not-even-once achievement, isn't really no-kill. Just that you didn't munch on anyone important. But this to-snack or not-to-snack leads to an interesting mechanic that organically impacts how difficult the game is. As I mentioned, you get experience for chowing down on the more important people. Experience lets you level up durability and combat abilities. So if you're going for the no-kill achievement, you're doing so with a handicap that only gets larger as the game progresses. And this is an interesting idea, especially in a vampire game. Just too bad the combat's clunky. Historically, this game's studio has done games more focused on the story than effective combat. And that emphasis shows in the awkward combat in Vampire. It could certainly be a lot worse, but it could also be more responsive and natural. While we're here, let's wrap up the rest of the general game talk. First, this is an exposition-heavy game, but I didn't really feel the weight of it until my second playthrough, so at least the first time through it's interesting enough to not be boring. But the voice acting is strong, so at least the exposition is interesting to listen to. I've just looked at the blood of one of our recently deceased. I see. Do you have anything more to go on? This disease spreads and looks like the Spanish flu, but its effects differ greatly. The London strain is different from the continental one. I also didn't notice how stilted the character animations can be until my second go round. It definitely seems like some scenes got more attention to detail than others. Finally, this game could have definitely used a fast travel system of some form, because running through the twisty roads of London could get confusing and boring. 
But even with these criticisms I have of the game, I still think it's worthwhile playing. As described earlier, the main character is a medical doctor fresh back in London after fighting in World War I. This timing puts Dr. Reed back in London during the Spanish flu outbreak. As per my previously mentioned denial-based coping strategy, I don't know how much the different media sources have gone over the last huge pandemic, so quick version. The 1918 pandemic was caused by the H1N1 flu virus. Estimates for the number of deaths in this pandemic range from 17 to as many as 100 million dead. If you look at the trouble we're having in quantifying the number today, you can understand variability in a number that's 100 years old. This virus was a bit odd, as it hit young adults the hardest, and most of the deaths were due to pneumonia. There were three main waves of infection and death, with the second being the deadliest of them. And the second wave is when the game is set. So, I played the game when it first came out in 2018. At the time, it seemed like the stark portrayal of London in lockdown was leaning into the artistic liberty side of things for maximal dramatic effect. But now, in our current situation, the game's streets seem overpopulated, if anything. Although the game does address this in some conversations with citizens, with Reed asking people why they are risking being out of their houses at a time like this. The pandemic itself also seemed like an unthinkable and faraway situation that I would never have to deal with. Womp womp. I had tried to get back into the game a couple times between launch and now, but had never really gotten into it enough to keep playing. I think the current situation is what drove me to fire it up again and actually play, finally. Similar to people watching Contagion to practice emotions and live in a bounded world, Vampire is a space for me to deal with what's happening. Instead of being a failed academic YouTuber shut-in, I can run around as a medical doctor working on treating people while being uninfectable. While the stakes <laughs> inside the game are high and the resolution unknown, I, the player, know that the 1918 pandemic is over and I can't get sick or die from it. It keeps the real-world scariness of a pandemic at arm's length. Additionally, I think the game has become more relevant now than when it was released. The developers worked hard at making as much detail period appropriate as they could. Language, music, clothing, even the health warnings are rooted in reality. But one detail I can't find support for is that some districts were quarantined off from others. I bring this up because an uber wealthy community pillar wants to build a wall to separate the infected from the not. At launch, this wall was a pretty transparent analog of the wall Trump would love to build. In the current situation, the willingness of some to basically sacrifice others to maintain their comfortable way of life is more appalling than the aristocrats' wall. And speaking of those districts, the class divide between the working and wealthy class was reinforced in-game by having to cross barricades delineating those areas. The wealthy district is well-lit, clean, and for the most part seems like it hasn't been impacted by the flu or the war. The poorer districts are dim, dirty, and full of houses that are either run down or falling apart outright. Dr. Reed comes from the wealthier area, and his status is commented on in some way by the majority of characters he interacts with. Characters in the wealthy area are concerned with things like finding a good place to eat or their social standing while less well-to-do characters are worried about getting through it at all. I feel like there are echoes of this divide in our current situation. Many essential workers are being paid minimum wage or just above it while exposing themselves to risk of infection just to keep society from falling apart. And many more non-essential workers have found themselves jobless. Meanwhile, tone-deaf celebrities go on social media to complain about how bored they are in their huge fucking houses, or push for us to ignore the stay-at-home orders to save our souls, if not the economy. The well-to-do elite are safe behind their metaphorical or literal walls, insulated from the current situation because of their ability to just throw money at the problem. I think I kind of gravitated towards this game now because of the perception of control. In the game, my actions have palpable outcomes, good or bad. The things I do matter. 
Granted, that's how most video games work. You, the hero, come riding in on your trusty steed to save the world from ultimate doom. But in this case, saving the world means figuring out the cause behind the second wave of the flu. Spoilers, it's vampires. You figure out the root cause of the problem and, by the end of the game, mostly fix it. Back in the real world, it's like my hellish bus rides home from school on a global scale. The back half of the bus is full of fuckwits who can't help themselves but do everything the bus driver doesn't want them to do. So the bus driver pulls over because distracted driving isn't safe, or we just get pulled over because some guy in the back decided to flick his cigarette out on top of a cop car and then flip off said cop. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting there, which is all anybody has to do for us to get home. But no, dipshit's got a dip, so now that cop is writing that kid a ticket and I'm never going to get home again. So there's this feeling of helplessness and lack of control over the grown-up fuckwits and dipshits who have to go to the beach or get their nails done or whatever else instead of just sitting there and waiting for the bus ride to be over. So yeah, my coping strategy, beyond denial, is apparently to throw myself into a topically relevant video game where I can directly impact the outcome of a scary situation. How are you guys coping? I know some of you are essential workers and the world cannot thank you enough for keeping society moving at all. And since you made it to the end of the video, here is a free gamer life hack for the current situation. If you find yourself running low on toilet paper, check Lowe's or Home Depot. That's where we've been able to buy it, so yeah. And on what surely has to be a novel never before uttered sentence, that's it for this video. See you guys in the next one. Bye.